Hey everyone, and welcome to our June live event for National Sewing Circle. Uh, once again, we have Nikki here to answer all of your sewing questions, so thanks for being here, Nikki. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. All right, so we got a few questions that came in already, and we're going to get right to those. So our first one here is from Cindy, and she wants to know what causes the feed dogs to eat your fabric. <laughs> um, that's cute. Yes, the feed dogs um, are the, the little metal teeth that come up through your throat plate and appear to gobble up your fabric as it's pulling it through under your needle. So those, um, those metal teeth, there's, it's like a motion of kind of going like this. It goes down and out as it comes up and it pulls with every stitch. It kind of pulls the fabric through under your needle as you're stitching a seam. So it, that's, it's that motion that, um, and those little metal teeth that pull your fabric through and make the whole sewing process possible. Perfect. So when I read that, I interpreted that her feed dogs are either like bunching up the fabric or in some way like eating, I don't know, just maybe there's a problem with it. So any tips for that? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes your fabric will get shoved down into the throat plate and that may be a physical, literal eating of the fabric instead of a... <laughs> metaphorical um, so if your fabric is getting pushed down into the throat plate um, typically that will happen with finer fabrics when you're starting a seam so I always recommend starting your seams a couple of stitches in from the edge or use a starting square to start your stitches on and then keep sewing onto your, your seam onto your um, fabric um, to prevent the, the needle from shoving the fabric down into the throw plate. Um, if it's happening elsewhere in the seam, toward the middle of the seam, you may need to stabilize your fabric um, with a tearaway stabilizer or a layer of tissue paper or something like that to give it some, some sturdiness, stability, and that will prevent it from getting eaten down into the throw plate. Perfect, and I love that we work tissue paper into the first question, like right off the bat. Of course. <laughs> All right, our next question here, uh, also from Cindy, and she wants to know, is it best to change needles every time you change types of fabric? Um, no, I don't think you would need to change the needle when you change types of fabric, unless you're changing to something special, like, like leather, maybe if you're changing from a regular quilting cotton to a leather, you'd want to use a leather needle. Or if you're changing to like a really thin chiffon or a satin, you may want to use a microtex needle that has that really sharp point to avoid snags and runs and things like that. Um, but in general, uh, I like to change my needle between projects because a project, a project, you know, is going to take anywhere from four to six hours, and they recommend changing the needle every six hours of continuous sewing. Um, or if your fabric starts flagging on the machine, if you hear the thunk, thunk, thunk sound every time your needle goes through your fabric, and if your fabric is flagging on the machine bed, if it's every time the needle goes through, it kind of bump, bump, bumps up, that means your needle is dull, and you want to change your needle. Um, so that is when you would change your needle, not specifically, not necessarily when you're changing fabric types, unless it is a fabric that requires a special needle. Perfect. All right, and next question here, Mary would like some tips for sewing with knits. Great. Yes, tips for sewing knits. Um, so when sewing knits, you want to use a ballpoint needle. So another time you would change your needle is if you're sewing with knits. Um, a ballpoint needle has a more rounded tip instead of a really pointed tip, and that rounded tip uh, prevents the needle from cutting through the fibers of the knit and increasing your chance of getting holes in the knit or runs in the knit. So the ballpoint needle tip will kind of nestle in between those fibers and preserve the stretch of your knit. A uh, ballpoint needle may also go by the name of a jersey needle or a stretch needle. They all have the same basic construction, and they're all good for sewing with knits. Um, you want to make sure you're using a 
either an all-purpose thread or a polyester thread <clears throat> and not a 100% cotton thread. Cotton thread does not have any stretch or give and even if you're you know sewing with a stretch stitch um, that cotton thread um, is not going to stretch with your fabric and you can get seam breakage and things. So um, an all-purpose thread is a, a cotton wrapped polyester core thread so that will have some give to it and the 100% polyester thread obviously polyester will have a lot of give um, so and then when you are sewing seams that need to have stretch so um, if you're sewing like a neckline seam and that neckline is going to need to stretch over your head you want to use a stretch stitch so a zigzag stitch or a triple stretch stitch um, <clears throat> Or something like that that has stretch to the to the stitch. Um, some people like to use those stitches for all of the construction seams on knits, even like uh, side seams, vertical side seams that don't technically need to stretch. Um, some people like to use a stretch stitch for that as well. It's not technically necessary, um, but for seams that will need to stretch. Um, seams that go around the circumference of the body. It's a good idea to use those stretch stitches. Um, and when sewing a knit that is a little bit of a finer, lighter weight knit, um, I have a jersey knit top over there that I'm looking at, like trying to remember all my tips for sewing that. Um, that jersey knit was a very kind of slinky, lightweight, really stretchy knit. I use tissue paper a lot with that one, um, and that helps to stabilize the knit fabric. Sometimes when you you sew your zigzag stitch around the neckline um, to attach your you know your ribbing or whatever, the the seam will get really wavy, and that'll happen on hems a lot of times too. Throw a layer of tissue paper under the fabric, and that will stabilize that enough to. Um, eliminate the that waviness of the fabric and some of that will the waviness will um, will be removed when you steam or press the seam but tissue paper definitely helps um, and let's see um, a roller foot can help when stitching knit because you don't want the knit to stretch as it's going under the the needle and the presser foot. Um, so sometimes the presser foot pressure can be so intense that it's kind of smashing down on your fabric and the feed dogs are trying to pull that through and it gets stretched or you get your seams shifting. Um, so a roller foot can be really helpful that um, just has that little metal steam roller on the bottom that helps um, roll that top layer of fabric through under the foot in conjunction with the feed dogs pulling the bottom layer. Um, they also make a foot called a knit foot. Um, I have not used one of those, but it's a really narrow foot, so um, it doesn't take up a lot of, it doesn't press down on a large area of fabric. It presses down on just the tiny little area of fabric, which will decrease stretching as well. Um, a Teflon foot or a PTFE foot is a foot that is, um, often used for sewing vinyl fabrics. That helps the fabric slip through under the presser foot as well, so that can eliminate a lot of stretching from your knit fabrics. Um, and a walking foot, or sometimes called an even feed foot, will do the same thing as a roller foot, but maybe to a larger degree, helping pull the, the upper layer of fabric through um, under the presser foot, as with the feed dog. So keeping the layers even and preventing stretching. Um, that's the, I think it's the definitely a, a good amount of tips to get started. They'll definitely get her going and starting this, and if she has anything more specific later, um, definitely can ask more. Uh, our next question here is from Brenda, and she wants to know how you do embroidery so the bobbin threads do not show on top. Um, that would be a tension issue. So you will want to, let's see, decrease your needle tension. Um, so that the the bobbin threads won't be pulled up to the, the top of the fabric. And also, um, using a, a bobbin thread that matches your needle thread 
in those instances will also help um, if your bobbin thread does come up to the top of the fabric you won't they'll blend in a little bit better but yeah that'll be that'll be a tension issue absolutely all right our next question here is from Michael and they say my major issue is sewing underarms where there is several edges of different pieces sewn together it is a big clump that bogs down when the bogs down the machine when sewing over it uh, help yes um, yeah you get a lot of layers right there in that underarm seam with the, the side seam and the sleeve underarm seam and then the arms I seam right there and all of those the layers of fabric and the layers of the seam allowances can get really thick so you can um, clip out the seam allowances to kind of decrease some of that bulk um, but I find that um, sewing the sleeve in first before you sew the the underarm seam and the side seam uh, not only helps with all those layers of bulk but um, it's easier too for me it just seems easier to set in a sleeve when everything is flat and then you also decrease the number of seams that you have to sew instead of three it's two um, so that can help and even when you're sewing that way the setting in the sleeve first and then sewing uh, the underarm seam and the side seam all in one go. Even if you do that, you may like to, if you're, especially if you're using a heavier weight fabric, clip out some of those seam allowances uh, before you sew that last seam. So clipping that, that out will just get rid of, it's really just, you're clipping out this tiny little area of the seam allowance right where that, the seams will cross. Um, so it's just a tiny little clip, but getting rid of those layers of seam allowance can really make a huge difference in sewing over that bulky area. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, this is from Pat. They say, what, which stabilizers are most important to have on hand for beginner embroidery? I am a big fan of the tearaway version of stabilizers. Um, cutaway stabilizers seem to be heavier weight and thicker and um, the extra step of having to cut the stabilizer away from the design perimeter is always, I never wanted to bother with that. And I feel like uh, beginner embroidery, you're going to be embroidering on things like quilting cottons and, you know, t-shirt weight knits or something like that. And you want to match the weight of your stabilizer to the weight of the fabric that you're embroidering. So having a light to medium weight stabilizer on hand is going to match most of your fabrics. Um, the tearaway stabilizers are just really easy to use. Stitch your design, carefully tear them away from the edge. Um, with water soluble varieties, it's I always found that it was just it was an extra step to, you can tear the water soluble variety away as well, but then to go in with a a washcloth or having to wash the thing and to get rid of the rest of the stabilizer was it was a step too many for me um, and the what but the water soluble stabilizer does come in a paper like variety and a film like variety so um, the film like variety is good as a topper um, but that's for if you're sewing terry cloth something with a pile you're not going to be doing that in you know the first couple designs you sew probably um, so you can save the, the water-soluble toppers for later. Um, <clears throat> the water-soluble um, fabric-like variety of stabilizer <coughs> is a nice lightweight stabilizer as well. And after you tear it away from the design perimeter, you don't actually have to go in and dissolve the rest with water if you don't want to. So you could leave it just like a tearaway stabilizer. So that would not be a bad thing to have on hand. But I mean, the tearaway stabilizer, it did. I never needed anything other than tearaway stabilizer for all the embroidery that I did. So that's always been my go-to. That's what I recommend. It's really easy to use and simple to start with. Perfect. All right, our next question here. This is from Shirley. And she wants to know, how can I determine what kind of thread is on the spool if the label is gone? I don't know whether several spools in my stash or cotton or polyester. 
That is a great question, Shirley. That's a problem that I have sometimes because I like to take the stickers off of the spools of thread so that they don't get in my way. <laughs> and then you have to you know, know what your fiber content is. So um, cotton threads, they will not have any give to them, as I was saying before. So you can give it a little tug and see if your thread has any sort of stretch. It'll be a polyester or a cotton poly all-purpose thread. Um, you can also try the burn test, which I have never tried with thread. I've only done it with fabric, but I imagine the same rules would apply. So being very cautious with your, your lighter or your matches, doing it over the sink or over a plate or something, away from all the flammable things in your sewing room, um, just burn a little section of the thread. Uh, cotton thread is going to smell like burning paper. It's going to have ash that is fine and powdery. Uh, cotton poly, all-purpose or 100% polyester thread is going to have a slightly um, chemical smell to it. And it's going to produce like a gooey substance when burned. It won't have that nice powdery ash. Um, so those are a couple of different ways to, to test. And um, I know that the question was only about cotton or polyester, but um, rayon threads are pretty easy to, to tell the fiber content of. They're typically shinier. They have that nice sheen to them. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of different ways to tell what your thread is. Perfect. I can't, I can't wait to go light on my thread on fire now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Our next question here is this from Joe. She wants to know, can you sew on a piece of material on the warp and then join the other piece on the weft and have it look okay? Um, yes. Yes. Um, I believe so um, because that's kind of how... That's how you know a sleeve is going to go in anyway. So with your sleeve, your gray line is going. Well, I guess let's see. I'm just going to on the warp and join the other piece on the left. Okay. So can you cut pieces with the gray line? Not always going the same way is what, and I would I would say yes. I know I've definitely done it, but just don't do it on like a piece where it's like the front or something like if you have to put a pocket and cut that differently or something yeah um, if you have if you have a pattern obviously it's going to be a little bit different um, if you want a directional pattern going the same way but um, yeah yeah in general I have found that as long as it's on the straight grain it's not going to make a huge difference um, the, the warp threads are slightly stronger than the weft threads, but in all the garments that I've sewn, that's never really made a huge difference. Um, and I have, yeah, I have done that as well, cut things, trying to get as many pieces on a piece of fabric as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, as long as it's on the straight grain and you don't, do it on the bias where you would have problems. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general that you can do that. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, this is from Tammy, and she wants to know what skills are needed to sew a pair of jeans that are comparable to the $200 ready-made jeans? Sewing jeans is just, it is, can be invaluable for sure um, for getting jeans that actually fit you not having to go try a million pairs in the store. Um, I have never made jeans, um, but as long as you know how to sew kind of a heavier weight fabric, um, sew in a zipper, um, I think that's really as technical as it's going to get. Um, <clears throat> you know, you do your flat felt seam on the side seam and they make denim thread, they make denim needles um, for the, the heavier, heavier weight fabric and heavier top stitch thread. 
I wouldn't think that it would be um, real technical, but I've never I've never done that. As long as if you have a pattern, you know, you've got instructions, I think that it would definitely be doable. Um, you don't have to be, <clears throat> you know, an advanced twenty plus year seamstress to to make jeans for sure. It's yeah, I think sewing in the zipper, sewing a buttonhole, sewing through thick layers of fabric is really as difficult as it's going to get. Mm -hmm. I think it would come down to, like when I think of expensive jeans, I think of like some of the decorative elements that go on them. So you know how there's like the line of top stitching that goes down the seam that's on the, the leg. And that would be really hard to do on your conventional machine to, to be able to get it on there. Or like, I mean, I have a couple of pairs of jeans that are very bedazzled. So <laughs> you're going to, you know, learn how to do something like that too. So I think it's going to come down to the little things like that that are going to make it, you know, maybe a, a expensive jean versus just, you know, being able to sew a nice pair of jeans. So you absolutely definitely can still do that. Yeah, for sure. And that those, the lines of top stitching definitely make something really pop and look very professional. So um, a lot of that top stitching goes through a lot of layers of that thick denim fabric. So <clears throat> I don't think my, my brother could have done, <coughs> excuse me, could have done something like that, gone through those thick layers. So that might come down to machine capabilities in sewing through thick layers of fabric. Uh, but as far as skill, you can do it. Absolutely. All right, our next question here is from Jackie. And she says, since sewing on paper ruins the needle for fabric sewing, is any needle suitable for paper, or should I always use a heavier duty needle? Um, when I, whenever I would sew on paper, I would just use an all-purpose, all-purpose needle, whatever I had lying around. And that's a really great use for, for those needles that are like half, half dead. Like you've sewn on them for four hours and then had to change it and so you've stuck it in your pin cushion. I would use those from the, the purgatory pile um, to sew my my fab or my uh, paper and then you know it's it's dead and it's dull and you can toss it. Um, but yeah, just an all purpose whatever is gonna work for paper since it doesn't need any special anything special really. If you were to say sew on something like a cardstock, do you think a lightweight needle would break? Would, would be too lightweight for it? Um, that depends on the weight of cardstock. I know cardstock can get pretty thick and hard, and in that case, you may want to use something heavier, like maybe even a leather needle. I don't know. I've never tried it. But yeah, that could be a consideration for sure. Yeah. All right. Our next question here, this is from Cynthia. Um, and she says, how do you do welt pockets? I think it's called on a jacket, both both for men and women's jackets, it's a welt pocket. Yeah. So if there's a way that you can describe it without having to show it, but I'm pretty sure we do have videos that demonstrate it too, but go ahead and describe it a little bit. Good, that's good to fall back on. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the welt pocket is, I always liken it to a bound buttonhole, but as a pocket instead of a buttonhole. It's got those, um, the lips, kind of, on the edges of the pocket. So um, you can do it in several different ways. I actually, I demonstrate the bound buttonhole in my closures class, which I'm still proofing from when we um, filmed a couple months ago. But that'll be up on the site as well. Um, so you can use the, you can use the patch method, um, cut a patch of a fabric and um, sew your your pocket lines on the fabric and cut through the pocket or the welt fabric and the jacket fabric um, along the pocket line. Push everything toward the wrong side and then fold the edges of <clears throat> that patch, um, fold down and then back up again so that the fold is in the center of the pocket do the same thing for the other side so that the folds meet in the center. And then stitch the, fold the fabric back and stitch the little triangular ends on each side to secure those folds. 
Um, you can also cut strips for the, the lips of the pocket. Um, cut a strip twice the, the width or the length, the width that you want the, um, the lip to be. Twice the width plus twice the seam allowance. So cut a strip. If you want the, the lip to be half inch wide and you're using half inch seam allowances, you're cutting a two inch strip. Fold it in half, press it, and then place those strips over your pocket markings so that the raw edges of the strips meet in the middle, uh, in the middle of the pocket, and then stitch your, your little pocket uh, outline, cut through the fabric, push those lips to the wrong side and press, and then stitch the, the little triangular ends to secure everything. And that's your weld. And then, of course, you'd have to attach the pocket bag. Separate step. Um, but I think the video <laughs> would show that better than me and my hands. <laughs> I still think you did a pretty good job. I mean, you explained, like, what, what the weld part even is. So that's yeah. good. Basic. All right. Yes. All right, our next question here. This is from Elizabeth. And she wants to know, how do you pre-wash and prepare fabrics for sewing? Um, it all depends on the type of fabric that you're using. Um, for all fabrics that can be washed, I open them up and I fold them in half so that the raw edges align. And I baste a line along the raw edges to keep thing keep them from fraying and keep it from getting into a giant ball in the washing machine. And I always wash on the delicate cycle with cold water. And then I either tumble dry low if it's something easy like a cotton, or I'll hang dry if it's like a rayon or something, something that heat would not do well with. Um, but I love that tip to fold it in half and baste the raw edges together, the cut edges, um, to keep everything from fraying. And that's especially helpful with fabrics that fray a lot, like rayons and acetate, and things like that. So um, if it can be washed, delicate cycle, cold water, but always check the care instructions first. Some fabrics, such as a lot of velvets, will tell you not to wash and to dry clean only. Um, but you can also test a little bit, um, cut a little, a little swatch and do a little hand wash under cold water, let it air dry and see how it reacts. A lot of times the water will um, mark the velvet, there'll be spots or it'll crush the mat, but um, test it. And for other fabrics that say, um, other delicate fabrics that maybe dry clean only, you can test a swatch and see. Um, but if it's something very delicate, like that, um, and you test a swatch and it's okay, um, I would still hand wash. I wouldn't want to put it through the washing machine. So hand wash can be very gentle and delicate with it. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, this is from Charsetta, and they say, can you use your regular sewing machine as a serger? Um, sort of, yeah. Um, it depends on the stitches that you have um, with your sewing machine. It's not going to have a capability for four threads, like the four thread overlock stitch that you see on a lot of um, a lot of ready-made factory-made garments. But actually, my fa has a really cool um, overlock stitch that looks like a serger stitch. And I'm, I've actually been really excited to finish my seam allowances because I have that cool stitch. Like, I always I hate finishing my seam allowances. I know it's a, a necessary step, but I just hate it. But, but now I'm like, yay, I get to use this cool stitch, and it looks like a serger stitch. I can finish my seam allowances with it. It looks really pretty. Um, so um, check and see what stitches your machine comes with, um, if it's got... Um, overlock stitches um, that can mimic a serger stitch, but you won't get the you won't get the fourth thread kind of stitch. You, you know, 
Obviously, they don't have a, a knife to trim off your seam allowances as a serger does. Um, but even a zigzag stitch will overlock your edges. So that's kind of the, kind of a similar function as a serger. So in some ways, yes. In other ways, no. The short answer. Absolutely. And so if somebody has maybe been following and watching every month, or at least for the last couple months, this is the first time that your little, little brother machine has not been in the video. So what <laughs> machine do you have now? Yes, this is the Fop Passport 2.0. I've been very excited, very happy to use it. Um, it's, I love the integrated dual feed foot, which acts as a walking foot, but it's built in. I just pull it down from behind the needle and it helps pull my, my fabric along just like a walking foot. I don't need anything separate. And it's, it's got great, um, built in stitches that are useful and great decorative stitches and everything is just, I'm over the moon with it. That's good. It's always exciting to get a new machine, and especially one where you actually are excited to use all the new stuff on it. So. Yeah, for sure. All right. Our next question here, this is from Sarah, and she says, would you use a twin needle to top stitch denim to look professional in the hem? Yes. That would be a great idea. Um, twin needles to do hems offer a really great professional look because it mimics the look of the cover stitch that is used in ready-made garments. Um, so yeah, that would be great. I know they make twin needles in a lot of different widths. So just choose one that is, um, you know, the, the distance apart that it's about a quarter inch, it looks like on my shirt. Um, and yeah, that's a great, a great option for making professional looking garments for sure. Perfect. All right, our next question here, this is from Maria, and she wants to know, what is the best lining or linings to use, and does the type of lining depend on the fabric I'm using? Um, yes, it does. Um, I like, so for linings, it really all depends on, it depends on personal preference, really. Um, I dislike acetate linings because I don't, I don't know why I don't like acetates. They're, they're thin and kind of crispy and crunchy and they make me really staticky. So I avoid those whenever I can. Um, but they come in so many cool colors these days. Have you seen some of the crazy prints on them that they have? It's pretty cool. <laughs> yes, they do. And they're very... Um, affordable. Affordable, <laughs> inexpensive. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, those are the typical lining fabrics. So it's, those are, are a good choice for blazers and things like that to they help you, you know, slide your, slide your shirt in uh, under your blazer. But you can use anything lightweight that feels good against your skin, really. Um, for skirt linings, you can use a cotton lawn, wall, something lightweight, um, and something that would feel good against your skin. Um, I know when I was sewing my I'm sewing a velvet skirt and I wanted to line it and I didn't want to use a lining fabric that would be too too slippery because sewing velvet has enough slippage going on I didn't want to add more with the lining so using something stable like a cotton lawn or a wall there would be a good idea instead of going with a really slippery acetate um, and it you know if you're lining a really sheer skirt you could even use something to lift a little heavier weight you know you can use if it's the right you know weight and color and look in conjunction with the um, with the garment that you're sewing so it does really depend a lot. Um, I know a lot of um, polyester blends are really good for linings, um, depending on the weight of it, obviously, but um, a polyester rayon blend is a really good lining option as well. So, yep, it all depends. Um, go 
get your hands on the fabric if you can to feel the weight of it and uh, just make sure it'll work with the garment that you're sewing. Absolutely. All right, our next question here, this is from Rhonda. And she says, cutting and handling an extremely stretchy jersey knit is intimidating and new. Do you have any advice for her? Yeah. Um, yes, it can be very intimidating. Um, definitely try to get all of your fabric on your cutting surface. If any of the fabric is hanging off the edge, it's going to pull and distort whatever you're cutting. So try to get everything on your cutting surface if you can. Um, the edges might roll, so give the edges a press beforehand. Um, a press up and down, not an iron, because that can stretch out your fabric, especially if you're using a really stretchy jersey knit. Um, so up and down, press on the edges, try and keep those laying flat. Um, and laying out your fabric, if you're cutting in a double layer, try to... Um, see if you can line up a rib. So if you can get a rib laying straight, keep the grain straight. Um, but also, that's not going to be a huge deal if you're sewing knits. The uh, as long as you've got the stretch going, you know, with, uh, widthwise around the body, um, the grain. Um, if getting it a little bit off is is going to be okay, especially if the knit when it was constructed and when it was wound on the bolt sometimes they can get really off on the edges so don't try to fight that too much fabric lay as it wants to lay and how it wants to lay um, naturally um, is it's going to uh, be it's going to be fine and it's going to tend to want to go along uh, the grain anyway um, use a rotary cutter. That's that's good advice for cutting out anything. I always like to use my rotary cutter on my mat. Um, it'll give you a, a really nice accurate cut as opposed to you know trying to get around with scissors can be difficult. Um, and move yourself around the table to cut out rather than trying to move your pattern or move your fabric. Once you get your fabric laying as flat as you can and as straight on the grate grain as you can and you get your your pattern pieces down you don't want to move it you want to, you want to move yourself around the table you don't don't try to touch those pattern pieces and move them at all um, and I like to use pattern weights as well um, instead of trying to pin a pattern to the fabric um, pins in in my experience seem to distort the fabric a little bit um, especially if you're using uh, craft paper as I do when I'm drawing my patterns the, the thicker paper is, is tougher when you're using tissue paper it's not uh, it doesn't distort as much so um, pins would probably be fine to um, get your pattern pieces down on your fabric but I would like to use pattern weights it seems to hold everything flatter for me um, I think that is all for tips for cutting mitts. Yeah, good good advice to get her started, absolutely. All right, next question, this is from Pat, and she says, I sew a lot of ruffles, and I've tried the ruffle foot. I liked it, but is there any way to use it and make them adjustable? Um, I have never used a ruffler attachment. <gasps> the, you mean you've never used those big, clunky, noisy things? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm pretty pretty sure there is no way to make an adjustable ruffle with a ruffler because it, it just, it almost like does uniform pleats, you know, mm -hmm. and then sews. So there's really no way to adjust it once it's sewn down. Um, so I'm going to say no. There's no way to do to do. You can't, you can't adjust it to make it take bigger pleats? Yeah, so you can adjust the size of ruffle you're making, but like I guess my way of interpreting the adjustable is like, you know, when you sew say either over a piece of floss or and you can adjust it and make you can't do that. So you can change the size to either, you know, a, a small amount of ruffle, a big ruffle, but once it sews it, like it's done. Right. Because it sews a regular stitch length. It's not like a yeah. stitch that you can pull up on and gather. Right. Gotcha. So then how do you make adjustable ruffles? Um, 
Yes, so you can make ruffles uh, manually that you can adjust and you know adjust the gathering to fullness here and not here, adjust it evenly. Um, to do that kind of adjustment, you can either sew a basting stitch and pull up on the thread, or you can do a zigzag stitch over a line of floss. And that is a great way if, um, if you're trying to make ruffles on a heavier fabric, fabric where pulling up on the basting thread would break the thread or would be hard on your hands, um, lay a, a line of floss um, down along the, along the seam line and zigzag stitch over it, making sure not to catch the floss in the stitching. And then you can pull up on that floss really easily and create a lot of gathers and adjust them however you want. Absolutely. All right, our next question here. Um, whenever I use steam a seam to adhere decorative things on fabric, I press it to the fabric using parchment paper to protect the iron. However, when I start to sew, the adhesive builds up on the needle. Do you have any suggestions to combat this? Yes. Um, yeah, I, it can be uh, annoying to have to stop every couple of inches and you know, use alcohol on a cotton swab and wipe off the gumminess and the adhesive off your needle. So you could do that, or if it's so so gummy that you know you take a couple stitches and it starts gumming up your fabric, you can try putting some um, Sewer's Aid on your needle first. Uh, sewer's Aid is um, like a a thread lubricant or a thread thread strengthener. Um, you can use that a little bit on your needle and that would make your needle kind of slick and in theory the, the stickiness would then, the gumminess would then not stick to your needle. So you can try that. You can also try a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of sewing machine oil uh, if you don't have sewer's aid, but be very careful as oil can steam your fabric. Um, so you can try that. Absolutely. I would say too, just make sure you, um, like use the steam a seam and like set it away and let it dry and let it cool down, right? Because if you try to use it right away and then sew right away, it's like that glue hasn't dried. Right, yep, it'll still be gummier. So if you let it set up, it'll cool down and dry and stiffen again and that would maybe help too, for sure. Absolutely. All right, and next question here. Um, small pin tucks can be tedious to fold and press in place. Is there an easier way to sew them? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, historically pin tucks were sewn all, you know, by hand. You fold the fabric and press it and then sew a sixteenth of an inch or as close as you can get to that fold. And, you know, having to do that, um, those those beautiful vintage garments that have pin tucks along the entire thing are gorgeous and you appreciate how much work that took to make when you have tried manually doing those pin tucks. Um, but as with you know everything in technology, they have made easier ways to do that. So um, using a double needle, a twin needle, you can make pin tucks and you can use a pin tuck foot or not. So let me see if I can grab my pin tuck foot really quick. Um, I made a shirt with pin tucks recently and I did not use a pin tuck foot, so it's definitely not necessary. But a pin tuck foot just has um, a bunch of grooves on the underside and they make them with different numbers of grooves. Um, I think five, seven, nine, maybe even more grooves. Um, and that helps align the pin tucks. Um, the tuck can go in under the groove on the foot underside so that you can align them and have them be perfectly spaced. But if you don't have a pin tuck foot, you, it's not uh, not a deal breaker. So this is the shirt that I made. I don't know if you can see the pin tucks, but they are really great for um, for like pulling in the fabric. So I sewed on this shirt, I sewed pin tucks down, and then ended up at about the bust line, and it's, you know, got fullness under, so it's, it uh, kind of gathered the fabric in where I had those pin tucks. 
Um, and I just used my twin needle and my regular sewing machine presser foot. Um, so when you thread your sewing machine for your double needle, it's going to be different probably for a lot of machines. Um, the process may not be universal, so check your machine manual. But it's, um, most machines will have a spot for um, a second thread spool. So this is my first one, and then I, it, you know, the machine attachments may come with a second thread spool to attach. So thread your first thread spool as you would normally. Thread your second thread spool as you would normally, just following the, the first thread, trying to make sure that the threads don't get, you know, twisted and tangled. Um, but then when you get down here to the last uh, threading point right above the needle, uh, this machine has uh, a little catch on each side of the needle. So my first thread went through the left side, on the left side of the needle for that catch, and my second thread spool threading the very same way, kind of over top of that first thread, and then went through on the other side of the needle to keep them separate, and then thread one through each needle of the double needle. Um, and the uh, what pulls the fabric up to make the tuck is the tension, um, the bobbin tension on the underside of the fabric. So uh, when you sew with a double needle, it, it the bobbin thread makes a zigzag stitch on the underside between the two needles. Um, and so pulling up on the tension, increasing the tension, will pull those two needle threads together and tuck the fabric together. So um, I sewed like 10 lines of test stitching and pulled the tension up a half, you know, in half increments each time to see um, the difference that it made in pulling up, pulling in that tuck. So a thread tension of six made a relatively flat pin tuck. And I ended up with this doing, knocking my thread tension up to 8.5. And that pulled that tuck up into a nice raised tuck that I liked the look of. So play around with the tension um, and see what look you like for the pin tuck. Um, and for spacing, so since I used my regular presser foot, um, I just did the pin tucks. I aligned the edge of the foot with the previous pin tuck so that um, I wasn't trying to sew over the pin tuck with the regular presser foot. That's what you know the pin tuck foot is for. You can get pin tucks right next to each other with this simply by you sew a pin tuck and then you move your, your fabric over so that the pin tuck aligns in the groove that's right next to the needle um, so that that tuck can slide through under the foot easily without uh, smashing down on the, the tuck and without the fabric kind of stretching out of place since the tuck has some height to it um, it's not going to slide easily under a regular presser foot unless it has a groove to go under um, but I wanted my pin tucks spaced further apart anyway, so I just did the, the width of the foot away and turned out great. So yeah, the pin tuck foot, not completely necessary, um, but yeah, doing pin tucks with a double needle is really easy and um, you get a great kind of detailed look that's unique. You don't see a lot of pin tucks, so I think it's a great detail. Absolutely. So just to clarify, you're adjusting the needle tension, not the bobbin tension? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, the needle dial uh, make your needle tension higher to pull up, up or so the, the, the threads pull up the, the fabric in between. Right. I said bobbin tension. I meant needle tension. <laughs> I just, just wanted to make sure because like, what you don't necessarily want to be adjusting your bobbin tension if you really don't have to because it's kind of tedious and much easier to just do the dial for the needle tension. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. All right, our next question here 
Speaking of tension, no matter what I do to the tension and needles, when I sew with acetates and lining fabrics, they always pucker. Any suggestions? Yes. Yeah, that problem comes up a lot with those thinner fabrics, thin, slippery fabrics. Um, if you're getting puckers there, um, some of the puckering may press out. Um, but if not, you can try a couple things. So you can try a Microtex needle uh, with the fine, sharp point. Um, even a, um, a smaller size needle can help with those fabrics. Um, and um, throwing a layer of tissue paper under the fabrics can help stabilize them and give the, give the thread um, you know, a little bit more to grab onto than those, just those thin layers of fabric that can help with puckering. Um, yeah, that's probably, if you have messed around with your tension a bunch, it's probably not a tension issue. It's probably an issue um, with stabilization of the fabric. But make sure you're using a new needle, of course. Uh, make sure you re-thread your fabric first. Try that. Um, sometimes it's not a tension issue, it's just an issue in the threading somewhere if something didn't catch the right point. So re-thread, uh, make sure you're, you're using a good quality thread. Um, if thread has been stored in the sun or in a human place, it can go bad pretty quickly. It starts to deteriorate, those fibers start to deteriorate. Um, and that can affect your tension, and it can cause puckers. It can um, just cause a lot of problems when sewing. So make sure you're using a thread that is um, still good and good quality. Um, for those types of thin acetate, something lining fabrics, um, even a thinner thread may be good. Uh, like 100% cotton thread would not be great for those fabrics. It's um, thicker and um, it just, it wouldn't look nice. It, you would probably have a bunch of tension issues there. Um, so going with um, an all-purpose thread or even a rayon thread or something thin and smooth with a good finish like that, a, a rayon or a silk thread or something, um, that can help with tension issues with the thinner fabrics. Um, and it can help with puckering as well. It can help everything just lay flat. So. Perfect. All right, next question here. Um, I have tried to embroider, I tried to machine embroider on genuine leather. I've used iron on backing plus salvi and even salvi again on the front, different needles, but all I achieve is the stitching cutting through the leather. I don't hoop the leather, but tried both adhesive spray and tacking it onto the leather. Um, just looking for any advice that you have. Yeah, that's a tricky one, embroidering on leather. Um, I think the trick there is your design selection. Um, since leather, it does not behave as fabric does. When you put a hole in leather, you get a hole. And if your stitching line is, if your stitches are you know too close together, you're just going to end up with a perforation. And it is, it's just going to cut you know, cut that hole uh, in the leather. So with a dense design, with the needle puncturing the leather um, over and over and over again in spaces not very far apart, it's just going to like obliterate the leather and it's just, the chunk is just going to fall out afterward. So um, selecting designs that are more like a red work design uh, something line work, very open, not a lot of fill stitches is going to be better for that type of fabric. Um, and even then, it may be tough with the line work um, puncturing the fabric um, along the outer edge. So um, being careful in your design selection, I think, would get you going in the right direction. Absolutely. Okay, our next question here. If you're sewing with a fabric that ravels a lot, when is the best time to finish your seam allowances? Um, I would say finish them right away. 
after you cut out your pattern pieces. Um, um, just making sure that when you finish your seam allowances that, like if you're doing it with a serger, make sure you're not cutting off any fabric from the edge because you, you want to preserve your seam allowances for sewing later. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, having a lot of fraying on your seam allowances. Not only is it annoying and messy, but it can mess with your seam allowances as you're sewing. Because if you're losing threads along the edge, it's going to look, you know, smaller than it should, and um, it'll give you problems down the road. So, uh, yeah, use a an overlock stitch, or you know, finish your seam allowances however you want to finish them. Use a zigzag stitch, or um, if you're pinking, uh, don't take off too much. Make sure you leave the edge of the fabric so you know where your seam allowance or where your raw edge begins so you know where your seam allowance is. Um, but yeah, uh, finishing seam allowances right away is a good practice not only for fabrics that ravel but um, for any fabric really. Um, I, it would be a good practice for me since once I sew my seam, I always want to go on to the next step right away instead of finishing my seam allowances. So it would be a good practice to just finish them all right away before you even get started so so if you're gonna go ahead and do that like finish your seam allowance of your fabric before you put it together say you zigzag stitch the edge then you went back and you're making a shirt and you wanted to flat fill that seam or something could you still do that would you still do that um, you could still do that since um, you know with a flat fell you're fold it you're cutting off one edge and then you fold another edge under and that would tuck away the zigzag but if you know that that you're doing that um, if you know you're going to do that to a seam maybe don't finish that one don't finish that seam right away since um, holding that zigzagged finished edge under you may be able to see that still going through on the right side um, that's what I would be concerned about so that's a good follow-up question. Yeah, if you were doing a, a different kind of seam finish afterward, um, maybe just do like a line of, instead of a zigzag stitch, finish with just like a line of stitching or something. Um, that would not really show through if you're doing a flat bell seam. So zigzag stitch, you get some amount of bulk with the threads. So. Think about the construction of your garment and uh, plan that out beforehand. Absolutely. All right, we have time for one more question here, and it's kind of a fun one um, just because I like to say it, but what is stitch in the ditch? <laughs> stitch in the ditch rolls off the tongue really nicely. Um, stitch in the ditch is when you stitch a seam, like um, I always stitch in the ditch when I'm doing a waistband, or it's a popular technique for finishing binding. Um, you stitch a seam and um, say you fold the waistband in half to the wrong side. And stitching in the ditch it means you're stitching along the, the center of the seam that you just stitched. It looks kind of like a ditch. You know, the fabric layers are coming together. You stitch right in the center um, and that catches the fabric on the wrong side of the waistband or the binding on the wrong side of the quilt or whatever. Um, so, yeah, they make stitch in the ditch feet with the little flange in the middle of the foot to run right along the center of the seam. Um, so, yeah, stitching right, right along the center of that seam that you just sewed. That's stitch in the ditch. Perfect. Just a fun one to say, an easy one to end up with. But... So I want to thank you for being here to answer all of our questions. Um, and you'll be back again next month, right, to answer more of our questions. I sure will. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Good, absolutely. So hope everyone tunes back in next month. Go ahead and submit questions either ahead of time or live, and she'll answer them all then as well. But I hope everyone has a good night.